Merry Christmas, friends and family. I'm Alan Finley, pastor of Overflow Church, and we are so honored that you would spend part of this holiday with us. Now, I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're at home preparing for a day surrounded by family and friends. Maybe you're traveling and missing some of the comforts of home. Or maybe you're working and not really thrilled about it. But no matter where you're at, I believe God has a message specifically for you today. And he is willing to meet you right where you are. Now, over the past few weeks at Overflow, we've begun our journey through the gospel according to Luke. And in case you haven't been with us so far, let me briefly remind you of a few things that will help you better understand and appreciate the Christmas story. First, remember that Luke was the author of this gospel and he was the author of one other biblical book, the book of Acts. Now, although they're not right next to each other in our arrangement of the Bible, they really work together to communicate one meta message. So the second thing to be mindful of is that Luke had a purpose in writing these two books. That message that I just referred to is that he wanted to clearly show God's plan to bring salvation in all of its fullness to all people. So to do this, to carry out this message, Luke interviewed people who were there. He went to as many eyewitnesses as he could to gather the evidence and understand the big picture of what God was doing. Now, I would imagine that you've heard the Christmas story before. And I'm not going to try to repackage it so that it feels new or fresh. That would be like me taking this gift and just adding a bigger box or different wrapping paper on top of it. And the gift is the same. So I don't want to draw your attention to the wrapping paper, but to the gift itself. And I think that is what Luke was trying to do as well. He was pointing our attention to what is most important. And I would argue, this might surprise you, that the Christmas story isn't Luke's primary focus at all. I mean, we know it, we hear it every year, but Luke really doesn't spend much time telling this part of Jesus' life. Because remember, Luke's purpose is to clearly show God's plan to bring salvation in all of its fullness to all people. Jesus' birth is part of that plan, but it isn't the entirety of it. So as we read this story, this true historical narrative, keep in mind that this is only part of the plan. So let's read Luke's words, beginning in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this might be a shocker. I have never been a pregnant woman. But I don't think it takes much imagination to believe that this was not something Joseph and Mary were very excited about. When my Mary was very pregnant with our oldest son, Titus, I remember her getting pretty desperate to go into labor. She was already past her due date, and we read that walking could help her go into labor. So she decided to walk in one of those fun runs, you know, and when that didn't work, a friend recommended that she needed to eat a bunch of Mexican food. So we hit up the salsa bar, going, getting our chips and our tacos, 
our fajitas, anything Mexican we could get our hands on. And when that didn't work, someone suggested that she needed to jump on a trampoline. And I drew the line there. <laughs> I'm like, there is no way I'm allowing that to happen unless I can jump too. I just kidding. <laughs> I tell you that because that is not what Joseph and Mary were doing with this long journey. Now, I'm fairly confident an arduous, difficult, challenging journey is not high on the list of priorities for a mega pregnant woman. And I'm reading into the story a bit here, but can you imagine the conversation Mary and Joseph were having with God when they got the news that they needed to travel to Bethlehem? Just to put it in perspective, most scholars believe this was somewhere between a 75 and 90 mile journey, depending on which path they took. And it would have taken a minimum of a four day journey but was likely a week or longer. And on this journey, it included being outdoor in the elements, crossing the Jordan River twice, climbing massive elevation changes ranging from the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on the face of the earth, all the way up to the hill country of Jerusalem. Now, what do you think was going through the minds and prayers of this young couple? I'm like, God, can you send that angel back now? I could really use a way out of this, or at least a ride. But in the midst of their frustration and questions, God was with them. He was using their circumstances to bring about his plan. There was something going on much deeper than what could be seen on the surface. God was carrying out his promises. Now, Mary and Joseph probably had no idea that each step they were taking in that long, difficult journey was actually a step toward the fulfillment of a promise that God had made generations before. In Micah 5.2, God told his people, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah, one will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from ancient times. God told his people that there would come a ruler, one with ancient origins from the town of Bethlehem. And although Mary and Joseph didn't realize it, their journey was a necessary part of God's promise. And therefore, God would ensure that they would reach the end of this difficult path. You see, that's the first point that I want to drive home today. No matter what circumstance we are facing, we can be sure that we can follow Jesus in hardships because God is with us, because he is present. We can follow Jesus in hardships. And there is no promise that God has made that will go unfulfilled. He's not only worthy of our praise, but he's worthy of our trust. And friends, you may be facing a season unlike any other. You may be doubting if God is real or if he is good, but I hope that you hear this, difficult as it may be. God doesn't promise that our life will be pleasant or easy. In fact, Jesus says the exact opposite. He says, you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we can expect hardships. We can expect frustrations and setbacks, but Jesus tells us to look beyond those circumstances and to set our eyes on his coming deliverance. You know, it's sort of like when I was teaching my kids to ride their bikes. The temptation is for them to look straight down at the pavement in front of their wheels. But that's quickly going to throw them down and skin their knees. So I tell my kids to look at something far off in the distance 
and to keep their eyes fixed on that. Because when your sight is set on the immediate circumstances, the pavement right in front of you, it's going to pull you down. But that thing in the distance, that tree or light pole or parked car, whatever it is, it's not going to move. It is stationary. It is set in place. And when you fix your eyes on it, you'll quickly move past the momentary struggles that once seemed impossible, and you will move toward that thing in the distance, that trustworthy thing that you've set your eyes on. With Mary and Joseph, God kept his word. He brought them to Bethlehem. But when they arrived, that didn't mean the troubles were over. While they were there in Bethlehem, Mary and Joseph couldn't find a place to stay. This small town was full to the brim with people, and there was no room for them. So they had to find another solution. And when the time came for Mary to give birth, there was no bed There was no hospital room, no bassinet. This was a place and circumstance of humiliation. The most unwelcome way to enter the world for the one who created the world. But hear this. Jesus knew what he was stepping into when he emptied himself and became a man. In Philippians 2, Paul tells us to adopt the heart and mindset of Jesus toward others. Listen to his words. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Existing in the form of God, he didn't consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. This is my second and final point for us to focus on this morning. Because of God's presence, we can follow Jesus in humility. He modeled it for us. He is there with us. He doesn't just say to do it and then expect it. He models it. And there's a temptation, especially in our hyper-commercialized world, to turn inward on days like this. You may be setting your eyes on that gift that you've been asking for. You may be looking at the dessert table, hoping for that one thing that you want. You may be looking for some alone time and escape from the busyness. And hear me, none of those things are bad, but when we elevate ourselves over the needs of others, we have lost Jesus' example of humility. We need to turn our eyes and our attitudes away from ourselves and recognize the needs of others and be willing to step into their world. Be more concerned about their well-being than your own. And I'm not saying that I have perfected this. Believe me, it is a daily struggle But let's struggle in this together. Let's choose to follow Jesus both in hardships and in humility. Let's choose to walk in the light that he brings to this dark world. And friends, as I said earlier, I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you're in a season of tremendous growth and you've seen God moving in incredible ways. Or maybe you're in a season of hardship, but you're stepping out in faith, trusting that God will carry you. Or maybe you've been far from God. It may have been weeks or months or years, but there's been a great distance between the two of you. No matter where you're at, I want you to hear this clearly. God loves you. Whether or not you believe it, That's what he tells us in scripture. In Romans 5, 8, we read that God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't say that he will love us when we get our acts cleaned up. He doesn't say that he loves the ones who earn his love. 
He says that while we were still sinners, when we were his enemies, he still chose to give his life for us. But it's kind of like one of those presents. It has our name on it. It was prepared for us. But the gift isn't useful unless we open it. Today, I want to hear that you have opened that gift. I want to hear that you have taken this first step of following Jesus by receiving the gift of salvation. And what is so beautiful about this gift is that Jesus has done all of the work for you. He's paid the bill. There's nothing that you can do to earn or purchase the gift. You just receive what Jesus has given you. And this is how you can receive this gift. First, we admit that we are sinners. Paul writes that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And this sin, it's anything that we've done or thought or said that disobeys God. And that sin, even if it was just once in your entire life, it's enough to separate us from God because he is holy and perfect and we are not. So tell God that you've sinned and that you're sorry. And you don't have to list out every single sin you've ever done. Just tell him that you are a sinner. It could go something like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I've messed up and I've gone against your design. I'm so sorry. Next, believe that Jesus is who he said he is. The son of God who's come to save us from our sins. You see, he did what we have all failed to do. He lived a life that was totally sinless. Never once did he disobey the Father's plan or design. But even though he lived a life of perfection, he chose to take our place by dying on the cross. In Romans 6.23, Paul says that the wages or the consequences of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, we deserve to die. But Jesus took our place by dying one of the most horrific deaths that you can imagine. Again, remember, he loves us. And this, this confession, this belief, it could go something like this. God, I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he came and took my place on the cross. I believe that he rose in my place, and I thank you for that. And third, because we have both admitted our need and we have believed that Jesus is the answer to our need, we can celebrate. We can celebrate because Jesus is alive. And that good news, it changes us from the inside out. Not only has he raised to life, but all who put their trust in him will be raised as well. So you can tell God, thank you. Thank you for overcoming the powers of sin and death. Thank you for raising Jesus to life and for the promise that you will one day raise me as well. Help me to follow Jesus. Help me to live that overflowing life. Amen. Now, if you just prayed this prayer, I want to be the first to tell you congratulations. This is the biggest and best decision of your life. But like I said earlier, it doesn't mean that your road is going to be any less bumpy or winding. In fact, it may sometimes become more difficult, but it is so much better. And I would encourage you to find a group of people who can walk with you in this journey of following Jesus. If you're in the Kansas City area, we would be honored to come alongside you at Overflow Church. We meet each Sunday at Martin City K-8 School at 10 a.m. for our weekly worship gatherings. And we would love to have you join us. We're not meeting next Sunday, January 1st, but we will be back on January 8th. In the meantime, please 
let us know if you decided to follow Jesus today. You can send us a message on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash overflowchurchkc. Or if you're not on Facebook, you can call or text me with any ways that we can support and encourage you. My personal cell phone number is 816-289-2057, and I will be sure to respond to all messages tomorrow. In the meantime, I will close by reading our benediction. This is the passage that we close all of our services with each Sunday. This is Romans 15, 13. And if you're comfortable, I would invite you to join me in saying this out loud. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and live following after him.